Hey there, interwebs. I know I promised you an episode of How Fascinating today, but what's more fascinating than monsters? That's why this is going to be a crossover episode. Russell's Guide to Monsters Part 8, How Fascinating Part 6, Hellish Hybrids. What could be better than hybrid monsters for a hybrid episode? Last time on My Guide to Monsters, we looked at, and maybe ogled, demons who are literally hot as hell. And in the words of Virgil, Facilis Descensus Averno, the descent into hell is easy, but as Ishtar, Theseus, and Izanagi all learned the hard way, the journey back out is more difficult. So let's stick around for the moment and meet some of the locals. This is Osmodeus, no relation to Rock Me Amadeus. He has a serpent tail, the legs of a rooster, and the upper body and head of a man, which can breathe fire, as well as the heads of a ram and a bull. His mount is a sort of lion-dragon hybrid, with the head and limbs of the lion, but the long neck, tail, and wings of the dragon. Another person is a great king of hell. Oops, let me try that again. Another great king of hell is Person, spelled P-U-R-S-O-N. He's a man with the face of a lion, like a reverse manticore, and he carries around a snake and rides a bear. Vinaya also has a lion head and a pet snake, but he's also got a lion's body because he's just a lion astride a black horse. There's a good Woody Allen joke about the Great Roe, a mythical beast with the head of a lion and the body of another, different lion. It seems we can never escape Leonine hybrids, not even in hell. Longtime D&D nerds will easily recognize this abomination as the roving mauler, but it's actually based on the demon known as Boer. He has the head of a lion and the legs of a goat. Five of them. And notice I said nothing about a body. Don't let the goofy appearance fool you, though. He's a great president of hell, with fifty legions of demons under his command, and he teaches logic, moral and natural philosophy, and the virtues of all plants. He can also heal all infirmities and bestow good familiars. This depiction comes from Louis Le Breton, but in the Ars Goetia he's said to appear as a Sagittarius, a centaur archer. This actually makes more sense, and not just anatomically. We may remember the centaur Chiron only as the tutor of just about every Greek hero, but he was also a master of medicine and pharmacology, with knowledge of the medicinal values of plants. Sound familiar? Is it possible Chiron and Boer are one and the same? Load the head cannon and prepare to fire on my signal! Speaking of fire, Iam is a bit of an arsonist and carries a firebrand to set things ablaze. He's also got the heads of a man, a serpent, and a cat, and he rides a giant viper. Bune has three heads as well, but he's a dragon and his belong to a dog, a man, and a griffin. A lot of these depictions come from the Ars Goetia, though sometimes it may not always be wholly reliable. For example, Hagenti and Zagan are both said to be bulls with the wings of griffins and can take the shape of a man, but as we learned all the way back in episode 1, griffins have the wings of eagles, or bats if you're HP Lovecraft. How exactly one is supposed to be able to tell these wings of a griffin from an eagle is anyone's guess. The same goes for Bunet's griffin head. Taking it a step further, Vapula is described as a griffin-winged lion, but griffins already have the bodies of lions. A griffin-winged lion is either just a griffin or a winged lion. Citri is a winged leopard, presumably like the Akbars from part 3. Vapar is a great duke and appears as a mermaid. Forfer most closely resembles a bat-winged stag, a bit like the Periton, and he's an earl of hell and a compulsive liar unless trapped in a magic triangle. Epos has the body of an angel with the head of a lion, the tail of a hare, and the feet of a goose. Amon can appear either as a wolf with a serpent's tail who can breathe fire, or a man with a raven's head like a kenku with canine teeth. Marcosius is also depicted as a wolf with a serpent's tail and flaming breath, but he also has wings and can change shape into a man. This fiery winged dog reminds me of Samargol of Slavic mythology, which we also talked about in the guide part 3. We also discussed winged cats at the time. This demon was drawn in 1667 by Athanasius Kirche, and from it I'd guess he'd never seen a bat before and only knew of them by rough description. I'm also dubious that he'd ever seen a cat, either. This thing just gets weirder the longer you look at it. Obviously, it's got a cat's head and limbs on a humanoid torso with breasts and bat wings, but none of those look quite right. First, those wings look nothing like a bat's and are just a big triangle of skin, with what would normally be phalanges extending out from the sides of the body. Then you notice that those noodle arms are incredibly long and wavy, and one shoulder is much higher than the other. The hips seem to be halfway up the torso, judging by where the drumsticks connect, and that face is just a little too human. Credit where it's due, though, the rats look amazing. This image likely exists because bat wings have long been associated with the devil, and it was a late medieval belief that practitioners of witchcraft were his servants on earth and kept cats as familiars, leading artists to depict demons as bat-winged cats. These are just some of the 72 demons of the Ars Goetia, and many of the ones I omitted are either humanoid in form or animals that can shapeshift into humans upon request. If you're really interested, I left a link in the description so you can look it up on your own time. One more that I want to mention is Amdusius, who is a humanoid with clawed hands and feet and two horns, one on his unicorn head, and a trumpet he plays about as well as a third grader who just joined the band and has yet to master pitch and volume control. In this way, he can be heard during thunderstorms and provides the cacophonous music that blares in hell when their Taylor Swift CD gets damaged. If you want to mix misk myths, we could say he's also a minstrel of Azatoth, the blind idiot god surrounded by amorphous dancers playing vile drums and monotonous piping flutes. 
On the subject of unicorns, I have some follow-ups on those rare and beautiful unicorns of the sea, the narwhals. I'd always kind of assumed the nar in their name came from the mangled word for north in some language, since they live in the northern seas, but their name actually comes from the Old Norse narhaval, meaning corpse whale. They're called that because they're grayish and mottled, and like to lie still near the surface during the summer months, floating like a drowned body. Isn't that cheery? The reason their horns look so much like those of unicorns is because they inspired that look. Older drawings of unicorns give them smooth, curved horns like a rhino's, and the straight helical horn of the narwhal didn't arrive until later when increased trade brought them to public attention. That being said, it seems the artists of yore weren't always clear on what exactly the rest of the narwhal looked like. You can see examples of prints which gave them more monstrous draconic heads with extended toothy snouts, and piscine scales and fins were almost ubiquitous. This artist has even gotten the horn wrong in this piece called the Unicorn of the Sea, with the tusk looking more like a sawfish rostrum than any horn. Not that sawfish snouts can't make cool artifacts as well. This artist shows the Unicorn of the Sea and the narwhal as two distinct entities, and although the narwhal still looks a little fishy with those fins and vertical tail, it clearly has smooth skin when compared to the sea unicorn's scales. Also, is it just me, or is that sea unicorn really happy to have its portrait made and giving a smug glance to the audience? It's clearly just a unicorn's head on a fish body, making it to the Unicampus what the merlion is to the Leocampus or Morse. We covered that pair back in part 2, and discussed the Unicampus in part 5 along with Ichthyocoraptors, but neglected to examine the potential hybrid of human, unicorn, and fish. A unicorn with a fish tail is a unicampus, and a centaur with a fish tail is an ichthyocentaur, so I think the simple solution is just to call it the unichthyocentaur. Okay, so maybe simple wasn't the right word. In part 3, I also mentioned that hippocampi are sometimes shown with wings apropos of nothing, and I wondered if they weren't originally meant to be fins, which would make much more sense. In some depictions, it could go either way, but others are definitely wings. I thought that perhaps they started out as depictions of fins and were misinterpreted by other artists along the way, but for all my research, it really does seem that they just are and always have been wings. I suggest referring to this variant as either a winged hippocampus or a tero hippocampus to avoid confusion. We also established in part 5 that in heraldry you can stick a fishtail on just about any animal and call it a sea hyphen whatever, so I suppose you could also call this a sea hyphen terepus. Despite all the attention we've so far given to winged sea hyphen horses, we never considered winged seahorses with no hyphen. You're welcome to tell me this is a stupid idea over the internet, but I challenge you to say the same thing to a member of the 55th attack squadron. Those can even breathe fire. Another winged fish, yes, seahorses are fish, is the sawfish. According to medieval bestiaries, it was a sea beast with massive wings that would race sailing ships, and the name comes from the serrated crest along its back that it would use to cut through hulls. The idea of flying fish probably came from, uh, flying fish. Returning now to demons, there's a manga called Quan, and although I haven't read it, I've seen parts of it, and one of its monsters I've never been able to forget is the demon called a Bafuku. It has a person's head on the body of a large tiger and imitates a crying baby. From what I've been able to tell, this isn't an obscure creature directly from Eastern mythology, but I hesitate to call it O.C. Do Not Steal either, because it strongly reminds me of a few creatures from folklore elsewhere. The two most obvious ones are the Manticore and the Mantiger, which are different creatures but so similar they're often confused and share a Wikipedia page. The Bafuku is more physically similar to the Mantiger, having a human head on a tiger's body, though technically the Mantiger has the body of a heraldic tiger, which is its own thing. Another name for the Mantiger is the Lampago, which in Blazon indicates a beast with the head of a man on the body of a lion or tiger. Quan says the Bafuku is likely a man-eater, which is literally what Manticore means, and the Manticore is also a human-headed big cat. I went over both in part one of my guide to monsters, but neither of them is known to imitate a baby's cry. There is another creature which does, though, the Tianak of Philippine folklore, which is sort of a vampiric demon that assumes different forms depending on the telling, but which almost universally lures its victims into the wild by crying like a newborn. While the Bafuku is a demon with a human head on a tiger body, D&D has the Rakshasa from India, which is a demon with a tiger head on a human body. D&D also gives us the Were-Tiger, which even they admit is often confused with a Rakshasa in-universe. Jumping quickly back to the manticore, it has a man's face at one end and a scorpion tail at the other, but what if it were more centaur-like? This Babylonian stone relief may depict the deity known as Pabalsang. In Hellenistic times, he was depicted as a centaur, sometimes with the tail of a scorpion, and here he has wings as well. If you replaced the horse parts in between with the rest of the scorpion, you'd get a scorpion man from Akkadian myth and the Epic of Gilgamesh. In some depictions they have wings and in others they don't, much like the manticore, and it's possible they have legs of birds as well. Known as Akra Buamelu or Girtablilu, they were first created by Tiamat as soldiers for her war against the gods, and afterwards they found work guarding the gates of the sun god Shamash leading to Kornugi, the land of darkness. They're probably pretty good at it too, considering that they're enormous, their terror is awesome, and their glance is death. At some point since then, scorpion folk have entered pop culture as a stock monster race commonly found in desert terrain. 
A recent dish example can be seen here in the Mummy tie in game for the PS2. <laughs> That's an actual still from the sequel? That's atrocious. Brendan Fraser must be rolling in his sarcophagus. Really? Then why haven't they made a third movie yet? No, they didn't. Just ask the fans. At any rate, Dwayne the Scorpion, nay Rock Johnson, is demonstrating the trend in art of replacing the arms of scorpion folk with pincers, but those aren't a scorpion's arms. You could argue they are, if we define arms as appendages used to hold and manipulate things, but if we also define legs as appendages primarily used for locomotion, that means birds are upside down. Scorpions are arachnids, and like all arachnids, they have eight legs. If these are their legs, then what are these? Those are actually specialized chelicerae, which are sort of mouthpart peripherals. The point I'm trying to get to is that scorpions basically have handlebar mustaches of murder. If any of this is news to you, don't feel bad. Medieval artists seem to struggle with the finer points of scorpion anatomy, too. Another group of arachno centaurs are what I prefer to call the arachnians, which includes the subcategory of driders. I already said what I wanted to about them in a previous video, so watch that if you haven't already. Another centaur variant is the Leo centaur, or Mesopotamian Ermalulu, which has the usual upper body of a human on a lion from the neck down, and which we covered in part 3. Since then, I found this picture of an ornamental frise showing a winged Leo centaur engraved by Giulio Bonassone during the mid-16th century. I guess you'd call it either a Leo Terro centaur or a Terro Leo centaur. Philosophical question, would you say this hybrid of man, bird, and beast is an Ermalulu with the wings of a bird, a stereotypical angel with the legs of a lion, or an Opinicus with the upper body of a human? Before you answer, bear in mind that the Opinicus is like a griffin, but it retains the front legs of the lion rather than the eagles, and traditional angels, cherubim specifically, had four wings and four faces, including a human's and a lion's. Regardless of what you may call it, I'm going to group it alongside the manticore and the androsphinx, since all three possess men's heads and lion's bodies, sometimes with wings. Unless otherwise specified, Tero centaur usually refers to an equine centaur with wings, but how would you refer to this creature? It's got the human upper body, horse lower body, and wings, but he's unarmed. Riddle for the ages, I suppose. Take away the human parts and you've got a Terepus, commonly known in the West as a Pegasus, but it'd be incorrect to assume he was the only winged horse of mythology. The Cholima is a national symbol of North Korea, and its name means Thousand Li Horse because it could cover that much distance in a single day. For reference, a thousand li is equivalent to roughly 400 kilometers or 250 miles. It also appears in Japanese and Chinese mythology, unsurprisingly, but the latter also gives us the Tianma, another flying horse, and the Longma, a horse with wings and dragon scales whose name literally means dragon horse. Tulpar is a winged or otherwise swift horse from Turkic mythology, including the Tatars who gave us the winged snow leopard Akbars. It's thought to be a combination of a horse and a bird of prey, two animals used by the native peoples to hunt. I also found this image, which I thought was a mono-winged centaur and panicked, but here's the same statue from another angle and it does have the full pair. While we're discussing centaur variants, I have another follow-up. As I've alluded to before, my partner plays an asinine centaur in a D&D campaign I run. In layman's terms, that's a donkey centaur, and in part 3 we established that the name for one of those is an ono centaur. The problem is, ono centaurs are always male. Classically, all centaurs are male. Female centaurs were traditionally known as centauridae, but centauress is most common in English. Other names include centaurel and centaurette. I guess a lady asinine centaur would be an ono centauridae or an ono centauress. I feel like we've gotten away from demons, but how would you keep demons away from you? You gotta scare them off, but the only way to do that is to be more frightening than they are, and the church knows how. Because it wouldn't be how fascinating without a trick question, what's this? A gargoyle is one answer, but it's not a correct one. Gargoyle comes from the French gargouille, meaning gullet, and shares etymological roots with gargle. True gargoyles are used as spouts to channel water away from the sides of buildings to prevent erosion, and it often shoots out their mouth like someone gargling, hence the name. The decorative variant is called a grotesque. Shad's already got a good video on the subject, and it was one of the questions on the QI episode Gothic where I got to shout the right answer at the screen and feel smug. The medieval name for both gargoyles and grotesques was babuin, from the Italian babuino, meaning baboon. You can see the connection to demons with the baboon's humanoid body but bestial dog-like head and distinctive tail. The fantasy creatures known as gargoyles should probably be called babuins or grotesques, but neither of these names is as flattering. I bring the subject up now because the other name for a grotesque is a chimera, the hybrid monster of classical mythology. In genetics, a chimera is a creature composed of cells from two different genotypes. A famous case was that of Lydia Fairchild, who thrice failed blood tests to prove that she was the mother of the children to whom she'd given birth. It turns out that she had absorbed her fraternal twin in the womb and was using a reproductive system which genetically was not her own. A more common example is anyone with an organ transplant. Did you know that when someone gets a new kidney, they leave the old ones in? Kidney recipients have three kidneys. 
Speaking of spare parts, this next creature isn't a demon, but is related in a strange way. This is the entity known as the Papal Ass. The surviving depiction we have of it shows the head and right front hoof of a donkey on a scaly woman's body, with the feet of a pig and a bird, a dragon-headed tail like some chimeras, and a man's face on its lower back. The story behind it is a weird one. It'd have to be to result in this weirdo. I've done some digging, but it seems no one's really sure what the Papal Ass was or where it came from, only that it washed ashore on the banks of the Tiber River after some flooding in 1496. Along with the monk calf of 1522, it's one of history's most famous monstrous animal birds. The two were interpreted by Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon as God-sent anti-papist evidence of corruption within the Catholic Church and importance of Judgment Day. On the subject of destroying churches, another creature with parts from just as many animals but a more comedic tone is the Camelophantilopelicantiter minute. The Camelophantilopelicantiter minute, as the name implies, is a hybrid of... a lot. It has the hump and hindquarters of a camel, the head of an elephant, the horns and front legs of an antelope, the pouch and feet of a pelican, the snoot of an anteater, the fur of an ermine, and the tail of a newt, a single wag of which could level St. Paul's Cathedral. Its homeland is the equally fictitious country of Conteloware. New complaint. A human and a bull is a minotaur. A human and a horse is a centaur. A bull with a fish tail is a torocampus. A horse with a fish tail is a hippocampus. A bull with a snake tail is the Ophiotaurus, but where's my horse with a snake tail? Why is there no Hippophidios? Nagas are snake humans. Coatls are snake birds. Chimeras are snake lions. Sorta. We even have the Piranaconda, so lacking a snake horse feels like a massive oversight. By the way, another snake lion hybrid is a lion with a mane of serpents, which I'd call a Leogorgon. Doing a search for Medusa Lion turned up this gem, which seems to have pulled a Jurassic Park and gotten a frog involved in the action as well. This is my clunky segue to the next Petrachian hybrid. At the very end of part 3, I showed a fantasy hybrid of my own creation, the Petrachotaurus, or Bullfrog, with a hyphen. This is Tavros from Legendary Gary. He's also got a bull head and a frog body, but he's also got the upper body of a human in between. In some ways, he reminds me of Arachnotar from Billy and Mandy, who's got even weirder anatomy. He's got the abdomen of a spider, but only three pairs of legs. Maybe I guess his hooved arms count as the last pair. He's also got an udder, but it's got an extra pair of teats, and he's got no nipples on his chest. He may also be the most bafflingly gendered animated character I'd seen until the sphingiform griffin from Disenchantment. He's got the head of a bull and a male human upper body, but the distended udder of a female cow who's still lactating. This is not what arachnologists mean when they say milking a spider. Heading back in a more sober direction, you'll also occasionally see minotaur centaurs, which are distinct from boo centaurs. The boo centaur, you may remember, has the upper half of a human on the body of a bull, and has been a thing since at least the 14th century. The minotaur centaur is a much more recent invention, and while it's still got the bull body and human torso, it's got a bull's head as well, like if a centaur were part bull and part minotaur. Why do people keep putting minotaur upper halves on other lower bodies? Going in the other direction, usually when you combine a human and a unicorn you get a unicentaur, but on rare occasions you get this thing, sometimes known as a unitar. The one I'm most familiar with is Sparkle Lord from Dr. McNinja. He's not a demon, but he is rather like one, being an omnicidal, magically imbued, therianthropic hybrid summoned from another dimension. It makes sense in context. The final hybrid creatures I want to mention both appear more often in fiction than any of their unaltered constituent animals. The first one looks like this. I know it just looks like a lion, but it sounds like this. That's the roar of a tiger, the voice actor who usually plays lions when Frank Welker isn't available, making this sort of a vocal liger. The other hybrid is the bald eagle with the voice of a red-tailed hawk, who sounds like this. Bald eagles actually sound like this. Yeah, they're really not as dignified as Murica would have you believe. On that bombshell, I'm calling this video to a close. It's gone on long enough, and if it goes on any longer, the red-tailed hawk won't be the only one with a hoarse, rasping screech. As usual, if you like my writing, there's a link to my Kindle shelf in the description. If you want to preview any of those books, you can do so on my AO3 page, also linked below, along with my Twitter if you want my snarking on a daily basis. There are also direct links to the art I used, provided by Kelly Riley, Stephanie Small, Deep Dark Anna, Austrian Renaissance, The Static Machine, Johannes Holm, Juan Aguilera, Kyle Olson, and Chris Hastings. Lastly, I've provided links for further reading down there too, so check it out. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. True gargoyles can shoot water out of their mouths like they're the Unagi, though it worked better for Kyoshi Island than Notre Dame. I want to leave this world more awesome than I found it, and my way of doing so is by helping to create more cyborgs and chimeras. That's why I'm an electrical engineer and organ donor. Plus, if I'm dead, why should I care who's using my stuff? You remember how I said in part 4 that I wouldn't make another video with 40 plus monsters in it? This one had over 50. I guess that's what I get for going with a topic as broad as hybrids.